welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode 28. Today we're talking to Simon Haynes, a personal trainer who's worked at all levels of motorsport. Starting out with Williams in Formula One and now focused on Indy cars with drivers such as Ryan hunter Ray and Catherine Lang. We discuss the impact of fitness on your driving and how to find time for exercise in your busy schedule, nutrition and how to make sure you're getting what you need, specific types of exercise that you can try and even a unique piece of kit that Simon would rather his competitors didn't know about. The show is packed full of actionable advice and takeaways for you to try. Many are much easier than you might think. So, as ever, grab a notepad, grab a coffee, sit back, and let's get into it. So, welcome, Simon. Thank you. It's a real honour to have someone with your background on the show today. I think people will be really interested to hear about ways in which they can perhaps improve their fitness or be maybe more aware of their fitness and nutrition and everything to do with the human side of racing which is possibly an area that at a club level neglected but perhaps it shouldn't do it'll be great to hear your story and and the kind of work that you've done in motor racing because again it's unusual perhaps to have someone so focused on and motorsports clientele if yeah. you can find out like what it is that is different for a racing driver than another athlete i think you know that i've had some experience in the world of olympic and pro level sports over the last few years so have some awareness perhaps of physiology and some of this kind of work that gets done in those sports but it would be fascinating to hear what you bring to motorsports putting programs together and trying to fit things in particularly around timing and because people listening they're not professional athletes necessarily and so they've got to fit things in around everything they're doing so how does that sound does that sound good to see if we can get see where we get to on this one that sounds perfect yeah i've tried to get out of away from racing so many times but i keep getting pulled back into it for some reason so must be doing something right it's uh it's one of those things gets in your blood uh (laughs) yeah so tell us a bit about you then so where did you start have you been into racing as a kid growing up what is it that's got you into motorsport yeah i was like in and out of various different sports and kind of like jotting around different careers and then in 91 i got the opportunity to to get involved with the triple eight touring car team through uh williams f1 and then from there, got involved in Formula 3, Formula 3000, and working with uh, a couple of Formula 1 teams, Arrows, then Williams and McLaren, and on and off other contracted Formula 1 drivers. And uh, then so I spent a significant amount of time working in like the mainstream of British motorsport initially with various people and then developing programs and, and how how programs would work, not just in front of uh, one driver, which is, I think, what a lot of trainers and physios get lost in. And I immediately recognized that there was a need for a proper programming strategy for professional racing drivers nationally at that time. And then obviously that's become, we've moved our business globally from being then in the United States from 2001. But what was it that that got you started in in that sort of motorsports world because I imagine going back that period of time it, it's possible and I, and I am just guessing here but it's possible that they at a professional level it was possibly more representative of today's club level fitness so maybe the attitude wasn't quite what it was or what it is today in terms of the importance of fitness and things like that so what was it that you, you know, what, what was it that you were able to bring to that world and what what was your background before that and then how did you approach that with drivers who perhaps push back a little bit and say, this, I don't necessarily need some of this, or, or they push back on the idea of adding extra workload to something that they were already doing? Yeah, I was involved initially with, with various different athletes, and I took my ethos from working with a variety of different athletes. And then when I got my opportunity in racing through a couple of drivers that wanted to take it to the next level, it was starting to apply that mindset of how does somebody, like you say, how does somebody build a training regime around their 
everyday life, albeit at that time, a lot of the touring car drivers, they weren't professional drivers. They were people that were, were well off enough to be able to take that sport seriously and want to improve their performance, both from a performance in the car and performance as an athlete themselves. So it was finding really initially for me back then and it hasn't really changed it's finding what motivates that individual where are the the points where that person needs to be motivated a bit more and what do we use to achieve that okay yeah so that's quite fascinating so you you don't necessarily go in with a prescribed a racing driver needs to do this have have this kind of uh, program You, you take a more consultative approach and say who is this person i'm dealing with and how can I get more from them as an athlete and a driver from their training? Is that Would that be a sort of a fair understanding if I got that right? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at the youngsters now, we've had youngsters do our programs, move into racing for years. And now, even now, they're getting younger and younger. So it's, it's looking at what the young mind, what motivates a young mind as a young up and coming professional open wheel racing driver if you like versus on the other side of that we have clients that are successful business people that run in run a successful business 24 7 but they're racing and trying to take that seriously and trying to get their their training to a point where it achieves them success on the track as well so what's have you got any examples of what you would do? What would be what kind of things should we look for as a driver, or what should we be doing? I appreciate that different classes of car and different classes of vehicle have their unique challenges, but equally, I imagine there's a sort of a, a core, for one of a better description, forgive the pun, a core suite of things that you would work through that someone who didn't know anything about fitness and nutrition and uh, training would, wouldn't know that they didn't know. So where would you start with all of that? Yeah, I'd, I'd look at their, uh, it hasn't really changed. I'd look at their what their existing program is, what existing exercises they do, what are the limitations or what do they struggle with in terms of their fitness, whether that be cardiovascular, strength, nutrition, and We try and work their schedule around improving the limitations that that both they identify as an individual and that we can show where they can improve those limitations. That can come from what we do is physiological testing. We'll send a driver away for a physiological test, whether that be in the United States or over here. Then we'll we'll have a, a professional nutritionist look at their nutrition and then we'll build their their nutrition and their training program collectively around what their specific up and coming events are so we're using somewhat of of a customized periodized model which periodization that essentially for in athlete conditioning is the steps that you take throughout the season to train an athlete for you know specific performances throughout their individual season. So for a racing driver, for us, it would be what what we do for their pre-season to prepare for the first initial events. And then once they get into the in-season when they've got less time, how do we maintain that level of fitness? I.e., if somebody is struggling with their strength, it could mean more work in the gym with weight training or strength and conditioning training. It could mean more mountain biking or whatever their discipline, preferred discipline is for cardiovascular conditioning. There's re- really, we focus, or, or I, what I've always tried to do is focus around what the individual enjoys doing because they're more likely to adhere to that within a training regime than if you give them something that either is alien to them or they don't like. I've written motivation down here as well. You were listing all the different challenges that they had. <laughs> I've put motivation down as like, how do you like, keep that going? I've had conversations before with people about, is motorsport a sport? Are drivers athletes? And these are kind of questions because you're just sitting down all day, aren't you? You just sit. It's not a sport. It's not like running or something. And I'm like, no, I think it is. But we we're having, having these yeah. conversations. And there's when you're talking about periodized training and things like that, you can do 
a sort of a battery of activities and then you can do your training and then you can do those battery of activities at the other end and you can measure some kind of effect of that training program or that training block and it has hopefully some correlation to a performance say we're talking about running has some correlation to a performance on the track that you can measure but with racing it's well i don't know i would guess it's slightly less correlated it's slightly i can be fitter than you or you can be fitter than me but it doesn't necessarily mean if i'm fitter it doesn't mean i'm quicker do do you see so how do you work that one through so in other words you're referring to the fact that you if you're not necessarily in the best car, as an example, why should I then worry about my fitness if I'm driving a car that's at the back of the grid? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, it isn't that's I've never really found that's the way drivers or athletes look at their performance. They're they're really looking to be that to have the best equipment that they can get into, which often isn't the best. But with that, they're looking for the best performance within the parameters that they've got available. For us, it would be making them cardiovascularly able to do that race distance comfortably, have enough strength to be able to manage the car, whether that's dealing with G-forces or the heat acclimation within the car, which is is a combination of both training and nutrition and hydration and a lot of those things can be analyzed mathematically and measured now there's a range of systems available that we can do research and we can measure the effectiveness of these training systems so it's not a kind of shot in the dark system that it was in the the early 90s when i first got involved in in training drivers okay so there is a correlation or that there is a match between the there's these the fitness metrics that you've got and an expected performance in terms of because there's more than just the ability to do one lap it's a kind of a sustained period of time it's a sort of consistency over a stint or however long your race is it's uh, one of the interesting questions i have for you or interesting to me anyway was how people manage their day so you, you've got your race but it might be that you're out on track and it might be a track day you might be out three or four times in a day and during that period of time what do you do in the middle because you've got nerves you might not want to eat you might what would you be your recommendation for people in terms of how they manage that sort of nutrition and exercise piece are they moving around should they be resting what do you think how should people manage their day dependent on the anxiety levels and that is purely an individual thing often these drivers again now i'm looking at the semi-professional and the professional level whether it's over here or North America, it's that they've got sponsorship meetings. So they've got a lot, they've got a lot to do within the construct of that race weekend to accomplish that's not just time on the track, as you say. And then it's building the, the time that they need to sit down and have their have their meals, have their nutrition, whether that's easier to provide using shakes or hydration systems or meal replacement systems rather than affected meals themselves. A lot of the time that depends on whether they've got a full, fully comprehensive team behind them that, pro- that are, you're able to provide all that at the racetrack or whether it's family members that are, are bringing prepared meals and able to provide that on behalf of the driver. And again, each situation is, is individualistic. It's uh, person specific. I mean, is there anything that you would just simply avoid? I mean, I would obviously everybody is on a targeted nutrition program. So I'd avoid going to a race weekend and just eating what you want, because that's, <laughs> I know it sounds bad. I know that sounds bad, but that's, that's a recipe for disaster. That's like a, a basketball player going to a basketball track for a uh, uh, court for a game and then eating a burger before they go on the court. I'm just throwing it back here in the sense of this is the kind of food that's available to purchase. And then yeah. the other, it's just trying to like maybe, so, so what basically what you're saying is to be proactive about what you're going to eat during your weekend and treat it more like a sporting event. And this is the mindset that maybe not everyone not everyone listening may adopt that. I mean, many people do, of course, but not everyone thinks of it as in the set in that way. So it's just fascinating to get your perspective. I, I'm looking at you like I can't imagine anyone not wanting to do it like that. <laughs> no, I, I totally get what you, where you're coming. I totally get where you're coming from because we've even gone so far as having gentlemen drivers not just plan their nutrition for the race event, 
they'll go and they'll go to a test day and they'll test that nutrition program. And quite often what we'll find is that there are problems in that when they go and when they go and test what they're going to do and some of it doesn't work. And it's better to have that knowledge on a test day than when you're actually at your event. So that's a recommendation I would make to your viewers of club racers that I would say if you're going to implement a, a nutritional program, I would, and you're able to go and either independently test a car or go to a test day, test that regime at that test like you're testing the car. You're testing yourself as a human being. I think that's a great suggestion. The, the, the bit that would be slightly more difficult to test is the nerves. I think personally, as someone who races, when I go on a test or a track day, test day, my, my level of nerves is significantly lower than on a race weekend. But I still think you, you, you've got, it, it's, it's this sort of prolonged period of stress actually through the day. I did, I've actually done a bit of work with a driver, a coach, and we put a heart rate monitor on him for the day, pretty low tech stuff really. And we saw his heart rate in the morning and it was whatever it was, 70, 80, whatever it was. And then we had his, measured his heart rate through 15, 20 minute session and, and it went up quite high. It was, he was obviously working fairly hard I can't remember what the exact number was, 100 and something. But what was interesting was that heart rate didn't, when he'd finished, it didn't come back down to his resting heart rate that had been earlier in the day. It actually stayed fairly high. And then he went and did another session and it went, it peaked again. But again, it came, it didn't come, it didn't come back. And it actually during the whole day, his, his heart rate was basically quite, like quite high, like he was doing some light, brisk exercise even though he was sitting and not doing anything because he was wound up with the the adrenaline of, of just being out on the track and that must i don't know if you've ever experienced that but i guess that must be absorbing your energy and f being quite fatiguing and then, then if you can link that back to your fitness then that's all the fitter you are the better nutrition the, the easier you will cope with that yeah exactly pre anticipatory heart rate that is something that, that affects the people in all sports but we find it particularly prevalent in motorsport because of the time that you're waiting on you're waiting on the grid and you're waiting to get started and, and we have gone into using quite a wide range of high level psychologists and mental coaches but we've got we've got a great probably the best mental coach that I've worked with in my career uh, uh, that with the company is called s switch and it works they work specifically with our drivers or drivers that come to us and what's great about this system is that it's both it's actually all remote so they do it they're able to do this program th these mental tests these brain conditioning tests alongside their physical endurance and strength and conditioning program. So it bonds the training program together into a comprehensive system, which is like when I was doing races at Le Mans with drivers and they were then going back to Formula One and then doing different series. That's what I was trying to create was a system where we can offer a training provision, be it to a club racer, be it to a professional sports car racer, be it to a professional Indy car or Formula One racer. And I'm glad that we've achieved that and we're not resting there. We're try we're always trying to improve our program and our training, whether it's something that's delivered in to somebody that has their own home-based workout facility or whether they're working out in a race-specific all bells and whistles training team training center. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. I think it's great to be able to pull all those pieces together. And as I say, in my experience of working in Olympic sports, that's a given. You've got the sports science team and you've got the nutritionists and you've got the, the coaches and the psychologists and they're all, they all work as one group to to provide a program to those athletes. And it, it, yeah, it's it, when it works well, it's you've got all the pieces of the jigsaw there and they're as better, best prepared as they can do and they just have to go out and do the fun stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think what your listeners will find is that 
And we're, we're happy to provide advice and to, to anybody, that any of your listeners, is that once they even start to do some form of like fitness training towards their racing, they will see their concentration and improvement go up tenfold. Where would you start um, with that? Where would you start with that? Like going out again, I know you, you, you said it, it depends on what you like to do. But in terms of what would you start with? If, you, if someone's listening and they're going, I just don't do very much or I um, am I doing the right thing? Where would you recommend they started? Even if it was just a little pointer in that uh, in the right direction. Go out for a five for a three, four, five mile bike ride or three, four, five mile brisk walk run. That with a heart rate monitor on, not overly pushing yourself too too far and doing going too much, but go to a point where it's becoming your bike ride or your walk, your brisk walk or run is becoming physically uncomfortable for you, like it's physically uncomfortable when you race your car. Okay, and is there any, do you have a preference on doing, if I only had a short window of time, I'm just thinking about time. So if I may, I may not have two or three hours to do a training session or whatever, so, so I might have, I don't know, 20 minutes or half an hour or 45 minutes in the day a few times a week. Is that enough? Yeah. If you've got two, twice, two, day, two days a week that you can fit in a training provision into, then 45 minutes twice a week is better than um, nothing. And often you don't need to be working out every single day. You can do alternate days, which actually you might find is better for some people to do a workout maybe three days a week or two days a week rather than go all bells and whistles and go five five training sessions a week. And But those workouts are not quality workouts or they're not quality training sessions that the person that's working out twice a week and doing good quality exercises is a person that's going to gain from those sessions. I, I'm I'm definitely out of my comfort zone now. So, what is a good quality exercise session? Is it that you were saying, "Oh, I'm like out of breath," or is there a certain what makes a good period of activity like that, or a good exercise? So, I mean, just an example workout would be for 45 minutes, and I'll just pull some exercises out of the air. So assuming that we could provide, we're going to provide people how to do these things properly, like correct push-ups in a circuit, 10 reps, then you, or with, without equipment. So you do, then do yeah. floor crunches, 20 repetitions. You then do lunges for a certain distance. You then do squat thrust and then do some star jump and then repeat that circuit three times. Brilliant. And, and I guess that's going to give people... Is, is that working sort of whole body? You're just trying to get your whole body up or is that motorsport specific? Or would you do that for any kind of thing? Are you saying those, like the lunges or something, are you saying that particularly because of it's a motor racing environment? Or they're suited? No, lunges are good because you can do them anywhere. We significantly, as drivers, we significantly use, although the layman don't view it, drivers use their legs a hell of a lot and the, that routine that i mentioned yeah it is somewhat driver specific but it can be used for other sports as well i was envisaging if i had 30 40 minutes with a somebody that was a club based driver and i had no equipment what would i get them to do and if those exercises are done with with really good form and they're doing after a warm up circuit going through that three or four times then that and we're stretching at the end then that is a good routine because that seems so simple doesn't it and you think oh well, that's that would be that's achievable is what i mean in, in one sense i don't know but that's that's the whole thing a lot of these the, the problem is and, and i don't mean to be i always like to be i'm a positive person i always like to be positive and i've got nothing against companies that buy all of these fancy equipment and all the rest of it but a lot of the time i find that the guys that come to us, irrespective of it can be gentleman drivers or it can be whatever, they've done the fancy exercises, but they're not getting anywhere. And what they then realize is that bring it down back down to basics and get the basic exercises first. Then you start to get see gains with those exercises and then you see the gains on the track. Then you can bring in very slowly and gradually the driver specific exercises that are going to enhance what has been built by the basic, by those basic core exercises, like your push-ups, like your bench presses, 
like your squats. Drivers, Jimmy Johnson, all those guys, they still do they still do barbell squats. They're not standing around in a gym pat touching fancy lights all day. <laughs> That's good. That's Sorry, I don't, mean to, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to bring it down to... Well, we don't have to go out and buy a whole load of... That, that's a relief. I've got to buy anything else. Motor race is expensive enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the impression. That's the kind of impression that people get. That, that oh, I'm going to have to buy, buy all this fancy equipment. For example, I'm probably the first. I haven't seen any other driver fitness company do this, but there's giving you like a big thing here. Go out and buy a set of. <laughs> no, seriously, go out and buy a set of uh, three to five pound or whatever the or the UK the, the European equivalent Indian clubs. That's one of the best pieces of equipment for driver conditioning, Indian clubs. What is an Indian club? I don't know what it is. So you've essentially got like a, you, a basic club, but it's weighted. So essentially, if you extend your arm with a dumbbell, you've essentially got, you've just got that weight in at the end of your arm. Now, if you had, if you hold a, an Indian club, you've got an extended weight that's heavier dependent on what angle you move your arm so you can condition all of those all those areas for example of the shoulder that come into play when you've not got power steering as a driver in a lot of the series you don't you still don't and those areas can be conditioned with specific exercises using indian clubs uh, as along with a lot of other different equipment too that's fascinating yeah that's a really nice approach because one of the things that we one of the things we're trying to do at a club level, amateur racing or, or track day environment, is trying to do as much as we can with the time and resources that we've got available. We don't have a team of hundreds of people, we hunt, we, so we can't go into the nth degree on setup and we can't go into the nth degree on data. And we, but what can we do is take that sort of 80-20 approach. Like I say, in, in, in this case, we haven't got all day, every day to be to train for fitness. We, we, that's just not available we're not professional athletes so what but what can we do that will be uh, meaningful and that's really interesting i'll look that up afterwards and i'll put a link in the notes if i can find anything on an indian club but yeah that's that's a, a, a good tip it's, it seems to me it's a, one of your uh, maybe a, one of your unique uh, selling points is connected to the club but well, not giving, giving all the way your trade to when i lived in los angeles i i was lucky enough to the one of the very first partners i had in the first gym that we had that was a specific that was a race specific training center but it worked with a lot of other athletes like movie people and and other high profile people too the guy that was my partner was uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s personal trainer for Iron Man, and he had been using. I saw him use these clubs with Robert, and it just occurred to me that would be really good for drivers for the rotator cuff, which is the muscles that support the shoulder girdle and the around the uh, the upper back. So that that at that point, I started using clubs with some of my IndyCar drivers and they and it really took hold and we got a lot of results with it so did you get some feedback from those guys and did they say i feel better in the car or did they say i feel stronger or is it a strength is it a precision is it a what is it that they are, f are feeling uh, that's enabling them to to get that positive feedback what kind of feedback did he get it was it a lot of it was the exercises that i was giving them with, with the clubs amongst other things were it, it was hitting areas of the shoulder and back that your basic weight training i.e with dumbbells barbells and machines don't cannot hit unless you're going to buy a specific race simulator that has a weight stack attached to it and all the rest of it got it, yeah and and then they've actually felt that immediately all the way back in the car they've gone wow that feels better yeah and you can use that you can take a set of clubs to a rate to a race weekend with you and you can just you can rotate using the arm back and forth to warm your shoulders up ready for the ready for your first race and it doesn't take up a lot of room you can take a resistance band to do stuff at the track that's a good point actually so there's this i suppose implicitly we've been talking about doing exercise away from the track but is there something that you would recommend people do prior to them getting in the car is, is there a 
if someone's doing no warm up at all and they're literally just putting a cup of tea down, that's our race, off we go. Is that okay? Or just <laughs> kind of the James Hunt approach? To... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. That just came into my head. That's his reputation. He's probably putting a he's probably putting a whiskey down or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I would mention the specific core areas that people should uh, pay attention to, and that's the warming up of your hip flexors hamstrings, quads, ankles, shoulders and arms, and obviously the head and neck as well. We have specific stretches for all those things. We've done some articles that have looked at some example routines into some of the specific stretches and exercises that we, we would recommend people do. I rarely see people warming up in my, in, in just in my experience of club racing. I, I don't see them warming up and if I if to be honest and if you do they probably get some comedy comments from their competitors about it but then you go to a professional level event and everyone's doing something all the drivers are, are warming up prior to their race they're doing things like it's a, a tennis ball version I think of of the uh, of the light thing where the trainer th- like so you've got the like at the side of the truck basically and the driver's looking at the side of the truck and then behind the driver the trainer's throwing a or th- trainer friend, whatever, you're throwing a tennis ball against the truck and the driver's just trying to trying to react to it. You know, yeah, that's a good it. that's that's a good one. That works really well. And I've had the the driver in between stints for Lamar just take three tennis balls to the pit lane and there's a space where they got a wall and they're just warming up their reactions on the pit wall. It's just simple things like that. And a few years ago at the Indy 500, we had a, we set up a speed boxing speed bag so that they would warm up on the boxing speed bag as well and jump rope and exercises to warm up the neck and all of that stuff, specifically for the left side because it's left side banking. Yeah, and I'm just thinking this through. And, and again, I might have got this wrong, but people warm up through a race a bit if they don't do this. And, and so you can get to the end of the race and you're ready for the next one now. But... I suppose if they do some of this training ahead of time and warm themselves up properly, hopefully they would they can hit the ground running, as it were. Like, say you're going out for qualifying, you don't want to spend two or three laps getting everything, getting your head into it and all your muscles and everything. Maybe if you could warm up beforehand, those two or three laps at the beginning of qualifying, you could or practice or whatever, you, you get more from them. Yeah, exactly, 100%. And that's the same whether you're whether it's an uh, IndyCar driver, Formula One, or a club racer. I know it's encouraging. It's still an, an issue encouraging like club-based racing to do some of this stuff. But you'd be surprised in the States how seriously some of these, they don't call them gen- gentlemen drivers anymore. That's gone out the window. It's, it's now semi-professional drivers. They're all into this fitness. And I think they made a documentary series a couple of years ago called something the gentleman driver or something and it was they showed a bit the fitness stuff for some of the guys on there a couple of them were my clients actually as well in some of the cars now as well at, that those guys are driving you, you need it really because they are you've got that that the g-forces and such and, and the stints are reasonably long and I, one of the things with competition is that if no one else is bothering you're probably okay but as soon as one person dips their toe into the water and starts taking it a bit more seriously, the whole level of the series goes up, and you and you, you to compete, which everyone wants to do, you're going to have to have to keep up with it. Really, I think that's a... yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of these, the, the the target for a lot of these drivers is to race if they've got the budget, is to race British GT or touring cars or something of that nature so that they've they've got to realize that people of that standard they are taking it seriously that's fantastic this is honestly this has been so fascinating and i i I do think and i said to you said to you before i do think it's a subject that is underrepresented in motorsports in my experience anyway and maybe less so uh, increasingly less so in america but in the uk i think the fitness side is still a question mark and i get jokes from people who don't race about most sports not really a sport because you don't have to be fit to do it <laughs> it's like saying how many times during the day do you have to like pre- press a heavy brake pedal i say put i'll put three three barbell plates on a leg press and see how many times you can do that for the next five hours yeah, yeah exactly with precision as well because you want to be t- <laughs> it's all about the brake. Uh, the precision on the braking is where your time's coming as well a lot of the time so 
Yeah, it's a great subject. Thank you very much. And I, I will, as I say, I'll put some links down. If you can share those bits and pieces for everyone, and then we can at least follow up with that. And I'm going to go and research Indian clubs just because I have no idea what they're leaving up. And it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, exactly. I'd be interested if a few of your listeners actually try and, even if they took it from the articles or some of their own stuff, do some fitness training and give us some feedback on how they improved or what the difference was. I have an article on my site and it's, I hesitate to say it because you'll probably laugh at it, but it's a, it's a very basic one on just some strength exercises that I've grabbed from uh, a, a strength and conditioning guy from the Red Bull site. So it's, I didn't make it up, but I've said this is a an example that people could use. But it is only the strength side. And I think what's nice about listening to you is that this is this quite a bit more holistic. Uh, fitness is, is not just your strength. It's your, your breathing and your mental preparation and your nutrition. And it's, it's this whole, you as a whole, rather than you as a, this one ability to lift this particular barbell or whatever weight yeah that, but yeah it'd be great to to complement that with whatever you can share it'd be uh, people would be fascinated and i'm sure we'll get some comments and replies from people who say yeah, i've given it a go and it's great or i've given it a go and i still don't know what i'm doing <laughs> okay sure. at that point they're free to get in touch and i'm not in the i don't really need to sell anything but i'm quite happy to send them an email and give them some guidance that's wonderful look Thank you so much, and it's been great to, to speak with you today, and hopefully wishing you all the best for the rest of the season. Yeah, and to yourself, and let's, let's stay in touch. What an absolute privilege to have Simon on the show. I hope you were able to get some great practical tips there, and perhaps more importantly, some inspiration and comfort that we don't all have to be complete gym bunnies to benefit from better nutrition and better fitness. If fitness is something you've struggled with, either through lack of time or motivation, I hope this show has made it seem just that little bit more accessible. You may know that at the end of season one, I wrote the Motorsports Playbook, a summary distilling the first 20 shows into nuggets of wisdom. I made the notes so that you don't have to. If you've not got it yet, go and grab yourself a copy from the website. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com.